All right. Who wants a billion euros? All right. Thank you for participating. We got a billion euros back here. All right. All right. So we got to get him a billion euros, and they're just down here. All right. So in this PVC pipe, there are three peanuts. This is Yo-Yo, and for Yo-Yo, peanuts is like a billion dollars. Oh my god, I love peanuts, and I, I would love to eat these peanuts. The problem is, an evil experimenter has put the peanuts at the bottom of a PVC tube that is connected to these pipes that cannot be ripped off, and we took away all the tools that chimpanzees are famous for using to get the, the peanuts out. We care about welfare, there's obviously everything this chimpanzee needs to be happy in a captive environment, but that's all she has to solve the problem. So the challenge for you, as humans with a brain three times the size of hers, is to be as fast as she is in coming up with a solution. She has also never seen this problem before. I know many of you, this is so boring, I already know what to do. Um, it's obvious. Here she goes, you're gonna race her. I hope you know what your answer is because she's got her answer. I uh, don't yell it out. No, we took all the sticks and the tools out. Oh, don't yell it out, don't yell it out. Okay. Now, so the key thing is that she had never seen this before. This is a spontaneous behavior uh, and potentially could represent an inference. Gordon was talking about playing, at the end of his talk, he was talking about rehearsing playing in your mind before you actually behave. Uh, Piaget, the famous uh, developmental psychologist, used to talk about mental trial and error, where you'd actually try out things in your mind, represent them, before you actually did it. So this is an example where maybe Yo-Yo, when she came up with the solution, she thought, huh, I've seen water, I've seen things float, I think maybe she even knew peanuts float. Maybe this is a, maybe this is a situation where I can put some water in here. Now, some, some people probably knew the answer, and you're really super chimpanzee smart. My question is, does anybody here know the second solution? Yeah. Yeah. Who knows the second solution? You do. What's that? Oh, okay, all right, all right. Anybody who hasn't taken my free online course, who knows the second solution? Okay, I'll give you a hint. It's a very male solution. Oh, no. oh, pee in the tube, exactly. So we had 16 chimpanzees do this, eight of them solved it. The four males who solved it, they all peed into the tube <laughs> to get so the much. peanuts. You. Sorry? So much, yes, yes. I don't know what the comparative bladder size, but yes, they were able to fill this tube. Um, yes, they, they don't have the same sense of disgust that we have. That's a whole other lecture. <laughs> okay. So that's cognition, a spontaneous uh, ability to spontaneously solve a problem, showing flexibility, potentially even making an inference, uh, and that's very, very different than a trained response where you have to practice a lot and finally you learn a skill and you can kind of do it over and over. All right, so my two guiding questions for all the research I do is what is it that makes us human? Uh, I study great apes to compare um, and try to figure out whenever uh, Whenever we see that we, humans can do something that great apes can't, potentially that means that's something that's new in our human evolution. Um, and then I also study other species like lemurs and dogs and apes as well uh, to try to figure out, well, how did it happen? If we see something that looks different, uh, what was the process? How did either natural selection or either ran other random processes uh, lead to the evolution of the things that we think are important for our species? Okay. Um, but... Today, I don't just want to talk to you about the research and what I've discovered about animal psychology. I rarely get to talk about, in fact, I'm not sure I've ever gotten to talk about what I'm going to talk about today, which is not just what I've discovered, but the story of why I study the animals that I study. And, and, the, and sort of uh, the interlocking of those two things, where to do great science, I think it's very important to think about how you work with animals, which animals you work, uh, work with it. I want to tell you uh, that story. Okay. Uh, but but first, I want to emphasize the fact that that just like uh, I come from the tradition of experimental psychologists, I study human evolution, but I do experiments. And uh, in the workshop we're going to do later, what this picture will be very important to to think about. Because as Gordon was talking about play, of course, in any any time in science, you're not doing great science if you're not comparing two alternative explanations. And this picture, to me, encapsulates the challenge. 
which is this is my daughter Malu and this is my son Luke. And you can see this picture here where what are, what's going on here? Anybody? What are they doing? Helping. Helping each other. Okay, it looks like it looks like Malu is helping Luke go up this slide. And then what about this picture? <laughs> so maybe Gao is trying to help Anya Gi. And what you don't know, and one thing I forgot to tell you, is that this is the top of the wall, and Anya yeah. Gi actually flips over the wall after and escapes, and then takes the peanut bottle by me while I was taking the picture. Um, so she flips out and then comes and gets the peanut bottle um, using or being helped by Gao. So what I just said is there's actually mul there's actually multiple explanations for both of these things. Is Malu really helping Luke, or and is Luke actually does Luke actually understand that she's helping, or is, or is Luke really just using Malu as a tool, a social tool? Same thing is did did Gal say, hey, if you want to get out, get on my back, get on my back, come on, I really want to help you, or was it that Anya Ki was like, oh, there are peanuts over there, but I can't get out, I need something to stand on. Hey, you stand here, <laughs> I'm out. Okay, <clears throat> which was it? Was it that? that Anya and he actually, uh, and Gal actually understood that they needed to work together, and that Gal could really help Anya Gi, or did Anya Gi just use uh, Gal as if she was a rock? It could have been a rock, it could have been a ladder, but it just happened, all I had was a chimpanzee. Um, so just to tell you that what happened in this scene afterwards was, my daughter pulled Luke up and then pushed him back down. <laughs> so, she, so was she helping him, or was she having a play session where what she really wanted to do is use him uh, as a toy and roll him down the hill. Okay, so this is what experiments are all about. Anytime you observe a behavior, even though it looks the same between two species or two individuals, it can potentially have multiple explanations. And of course, in experimental psychology, uh, we tend to emphasize the most parsimonious explanation or the simplest explanation until you can rule it out. Uh, in favor of a more complex explanation. And you can argue about whether that's the, um, you know, always the best way to do it, but that's, that tends to be how people, uh, you know, how the logic goes. Okay, so doing that, uh, I'll just give you one example of, uh, just another fun example of a study, just so you can see uh, chimpanzees and apes being smart, because it's fun. Um, this is two studies we did, uh, or a series of studies we did. I'm just going to give you one example, though, from this long series of studies of chimpanzee cooperation. Because when we started studying chimpanzee cooperation, basically in the, in the experimental literature, there was a huge fight between the experimental literature and the field work. People in the field had seen chimpanzees doing incredibly sophisticated things. In the laboratory, people were like, wow, they do nothing. So I don't know what these field people are talking about because when we give them spontaneous problems like that tube task, but in a cooperative situation, they can't do anything. They can't, they can't spontaneously solve any problems. So it must be that whatever they're doing in the wild, it's not very sophisticated and nothing like humans. So we came up with a new way to live in cooperation. And actually, it was a Japanese scientist who came up with this apparatus. And how it works is, it's like your shoe and a shoelace, where you have a board, you put some food on the board, and then you put a string through it. And of course, if you pull on one end of the string, well, the string comes out of the board. So you have a string and no food. If you pull both ends of the string, you get to eat, okay? But of course, as evil experimentalists, if we spread the two ends really far apart, I can't reach both. So then you have to work together. So two individuals have to Pull. But the key thing was, and the reason that Satoshi Hirata, who's my colleague in Africa, I mean in Japan, is a genius, is because we were doing the thing that everybody else had done before, which was putting, like, we had like hundreds of pounds of cinder blocks, and let's make it really heavy, and then they have to work together, because if it's really heavy, then they have to pull. Oh, let me tell you, it is the hardest thing ever to figure out how much one chimpanzee can pull, much less what two chimpanzees can pull. Because one day they come in and they're like, yeah, I'm gonna pull 250 pounds. And you're like, okay, so now what we'll do is when we put the other chimp that's about their same size, we'll put 500 pounds. So we put them both in and they pull 1,000 pounds. And you're like, okay, great. So now what do we do? So now we're like coming in with 1,000 pounds of cinder blocks. It was a disaster. Let's just, put, let's just leave it at that. This is so awesome. No weights, no anything. And so this is what experimental psychology is always all about. It's this stupid little innovation to make this shoelace thing 
seriously, this is like an FBI. <laughs> this has allowed us to see inside the chimpanzee mind. It's like flying to Pluto in a space probe, except for it only cost two dollars. Was you know this board with a string through it. So that's the that's what uh, if you study animal psychology or you're interested in it, it is really that simple. The hard part is taking something you're really interested in and made, boiling it down to something that simple to get your answers. And, and, and that's genius in our, in our field. It's like the opposite of rocket science. Okay, so, so here's what we're gonna do. We've got, we've, in, the, in the video I'm gonna show you, we actually have two boards. So we, we, you know, we have one board like this where there's an equal payoff, there's an equal amount of food, but we have another board like this where actually one of, the, one of the food dishes has way more food than the other. So one of the food dishes just has one tiny little piece of banana and the other food dish has a ton of bananas. Okay, so there's, there's two boards. So imagine double this. And, and so here's one board where actually you have, um, uh, there's a tiny piece of food behind this rope and then there's a huge chunk of food here and then, and then this is a camera looking at a separate room where there's actually an equal payoff on the board. And here's one of the ropes and there's another rope over here. So when the chimps come in, the first we're going to let in a dominant, and the dominant gets to sit by one of the ropes and make, a, make an offer, say, I'd like to pull in this, this board. And then the subordinate's let in and has a choice. Either the subordinate can accept the offer and say, okay, you know, I'll take whatever you offered me, or it can refuse, and it can negotiate. And it can say, nope, I want to pull this board. And so then the question, the scientific question was, can chimpanzees actually solve this problem? Because it requires tremendous amounts of self-control. It also means that while dominant and subordinate, if you're dominant, you have to understand that you have certain leverage in your relationship depending on the context. Normally these two individuals, because one's dominant and one's subordinate, the dominant is just say, give me that. You know, I don't care, just give me that. I don't need you. I don't need you for anything. Whatever it is you have, give me your water. You know, I want that pen. Give it to me. And you know, especially if it's a contested resource. So in this context, being bigger or dominant buys you nothing. <clears throat> but the question is, does the chimpanzee realize that? Can they have the level of self-control they need to solve the problem? I actually, this is one of the beauties of science, and one of the other things to emphasize today. I was wrong. On this team, I was the big doubting Tom. I was like, this is never gonna work. They're never gonna do it. I have seen chimpanzees do too many things. No way. Okay, so this is one of the times where I was joyously wrong. All right, so let me show you uh, an example of this where uh, it's Billy and um, Namakisa. Uh, oh, you haven't been to Ngamba, sorry. So uh, they're on Ngamba Island in Uganda, and uh, it's two chimpanzees named Billy and Namakisa, but they're representative of all the chimps we study. So there's Billy, she's the dominant, and you'll see where she goes. She heads straight for the big food. Mine, come on, Namakisa, pull this one. I know it's just one piece of banana, but just think how good it will taste for me to eat all of those yummy bananas. Okay, there's Namakisa, no way. I'm, let's do the equal, let's do the equal tray. Billy says, okay, you can have the big one. You can have it, you can have the big one, just kidding. <laughs> Wait. Okay, no, no, seriously, seriously, you can have the big one. I promise, you can have the big one. Oh, man, this sucks. All right, so this is where I thought they, somebody was just going to pull the rope. They just couldn't handle it. But this is really interesting. So Damakisa comes over, still resisting. <laughs> they had five minutes to solve the problem. Billy gives up. Now Akisa wins. They both eat, but they get the equal payoff. Okay, here's what's even more interesting about this study. What we found is 95% of the time they can solve this problem spontaneously. We didn't do anything, we didn't train them. Um, we just did some controls to make sure they understood the situation. But here's what's interesting, and this is really crucial also for thinking about animal cognition, is I really dis I discriminate between negative and null results. So a negative result would be one where animals don't do anything. Let's say they had failed this problem. Um, well, that's a negative result because I don't really know that the test is fair. A null result is where an animal didn't do something in a test that I actually do think was really fair. So here, what's really interesting is 95% of the time they solve this problem, 
And we actually made it harder. We made the division, that split, even more extreme. They kept solving the problem. It dropped down about 80% of the time. But there's something we didn't see. They never, never, ever, in all the games we did, in all the pairs we tested, no one, none of these chimpanzees ever used overt gestures or communication <clears throat> to try to recruit help. And you saw Mama Kisa. She came over and she stared like this. So maybe that's overt communication. But never. Chimpanzees are famous for using gestures. <clears throat> Bonobos too. For using gestures to ask for help. And they know when others can see and stuff. Never did we see it one time. So that is something I would call a null result. Where I think it's, it's, it's been a fair test. Look at the sophisticated behavior they showed. But what was absent and what human children do is a lot of gestures. A lot of recruitment. A lot of communication in this cooperative context. So that's how we can figure out not just what chimpanzees, where they're sophisticated, but also what sometimes they're not doing. Um, and so that's a result where I feel more confident to say, and obviously you want to do more studies, but uh, where maybe they aren't going to use um, communication in more cooperative contexts. Okay, so that's just an example of what we do. All right. So I, I had a problem though. Uh, I. I did my uh, undergraduate at Emory University. I actually was a student of Franz Ball, Mike Tomasello, and uh, it's all I knew was working with chimpanzees in laboratories uh, in the United States. And I had a problem though, because when I was at uh, Yerkes, uh, and actually when I was, uh, I, I, this was my senior year, an email was received by all the people at Yerkes, and I was on the email list, so I got it, which I always, to this day, I'm amazed that they sent it to me, is there was an email that basically said, all the chimpanzees are going away, uh, you'll be losing access to your animals, and you know we are in the process of shutting everything down because the federal government and the National Institute of Health uh, doesn't see chimpanzee research as a priority. So be ready at any moment. We may take your subjects um, and, and be ready for that. Well, I really had kind of mixed feelings about that because by this time I'd worked there for a few years and I was frustrated with the situation regarding welfare. And I had started to sort of question whether this was okay or not to have animals in this context. So at the same time, uh, I remember my first job interview I had was at Emory, actually. Uh, and um, somebody who was you know, pretty uh, a, a big decision maker, an administrator who went on to work for the NIH pretty high up, I had lunch with him. And he sat down with me and he said, look, Brian, you know, it's really great all the stuff you're doing. But I have to tell you that you know, you're a baby dinosaur. Your field is dying. And you really need to become a systems neuroscientist if you want to survive and to flourish. So this was sort of the, the it's a true story, Gordon. <laughs> I know you believe it. Uh, you know, you need to be a system neuroscientist. Have you ever thought about doing fMRI and you know, pop up people in scanners? Because that's where it's at. And you know, you're really good, and that would really fit your skills. And you know, my my response to that was, um, you can imagine, uh, no, thank you. Uh, but in my head, I'm saying other words. Um, so, as an example of the extreme thing that led me to really abandon the labs, I just led a petition um, together with the Humane Society of the United States that I think really encapsulates the culture and philosophy of laboratory science in the United States towards animals. So the New York Blood Center does very important work. It um, uh, actually did really important research. Um, and. Uh, they um, provide uh, clean blood to millions of people in the northeastern part of the United States. But in part doing that, uh, they started a research facility in Liberia. Uh, they did that because they had a brilliant scientist, Freddie Prince, who wanted to operate outside the regulatory framework in the United States. Uh, and in doing so, he actually was able to come up with several techniques to filter blood during the original uh, HIV panic in the 80s. Uh, and also to help have blood be filtered uh, effectively for hep C. Uh, he did it with chimpanzees in Liberia, uh, and um, the patents that were uh, generated from that work led to uh, $400 million of revenue over a 15-year period for the New York Blood Center. <clears throat> so I was on sabbatical. I was about to go on vacation. Uh, I have never been to Liberia. I have no interest in going to Liberia. And I got an email from my buddy who said, uh, my good friend who's on the ground responding to Ebola, uh, and she's trying to develop a vaccine, 
to save people who are dying of Ebola. And she actually does highly invasive work uh, with rhesus macaques. Uh, and she's working to save people from Ebola. Uh, she just wrote me and said that the New York Blood Center sent a letter to the, um, new, to the Liberian bio Biomedical Research Facility and said that they were cutting all funding. And that the, the 66 remaining chimpanzees were now uh, fully in the care of the Liberian government. Well, this was in March at the height of the Ebola epidemic. So they had lots of money and lots of interest and lots of resources to allocate towards chimpanzees uh, that had been abandoned and were no longer being used in uh, research. Uh, the chimpanzees had been put, uh, had been brought in from the wild. Um, they, in the 70s, 60s and 70s, they were um, tested for years. Many of them were anesthetized four to 500 times because we now have their medical records. Um, uh, the things that happen to these animals is just extraordinary. Um, so uh, in response to um, these animals uh, being abandoned, I'm about to go on vacation. Um, I'm on sabbatical in Australia. I've never been to Liberia. Uh, and we had to uh, mount a response. We had to get uh, international community, everybody uh, involved, and we had to raise hundreds of thousands of dollars because literally we had days. We literally had days because the chimpanzees were on islands that have no water and no food. Because the islands that they put them on, geniuses that they were, is in a saltwater estuary. So they literally had to be provided water every day, and when we first found them, they were the keepers were still going out, the people who were paid to take care of them because they knew they'd die if they didn't go out, and they were just nice people. They were giving them Dixie cups like what we have back here, uh, full of water. Each of each chimpanzee got one cup of water every third day, every three days, uh, and no food because they had no money to buy any food. So they were getting a cup of water every day. So so that to me is the ultimate expression. <coughs> of how laboratory science thinks about their animals. They have responsibility for them until they're no longer useful, and, and then if they're forced to have a humane endpoint that they, you know, thankfully in the United States, animals are euthanized, because the alternative would be what they did in Liberia. And the argument the New York Blood Center has made is that yes, we made $400 million off these animals, and you know, yes, you know, we were responsible when we were doing research, but actually they're owned by the Liberian government, it's not our fault. Good luck, Liberia. We are legally not responsible. So, I, I, you can tell I'm not uh, in love with the U.S. laboratory culture uh, or establishment. But at the same time, I want to remind you, the person who whistled blew, <coughs> the person who called this out, was an invasive researcher who literally was the person who helped design the vaccine that's now being used to save people. So I'm not against invasive research when I stand up here. I'm not at all. What I'm against is useless, needless suffering. Absolutely. And obviously I think that there's a, a nice dovetail between helping animals and helping people. Um, so the whistleblower, really, she, her name is uh, um, Lisa Hensley, and she worked her heart out for these chimpanzees. She, bought, she got a boat motor and brought it over because the boat that went to the islands broke the motor and, and she was buying gasoline with her own money. I mean, it was just incredible what she was doing while she was trying to figure out how to you know, test her monkeys to get a bowl of that. So it's a, it's a really interesting case. But I think it just highlights to you why uh, I, did, I didn't want to work in laboratories anymore. But now I want to show you a video, and I want you guys to tell me what's what's wrong with this picture. Or this video. No. Mm. So good play behavior. So who knows what's wrong with this video or this picture? Just yell it out, it's okay. Go ahead. Well, yeah, to 
way that like the chip is locked inside and the, the child is free and can do everything. Okay. Like that, okay. So the chip's inside, the kid's free. Anybody else? Yeah. Here, the chimp might be hungry. Okay. The food. Oh, and he's teasing with the food. She was teasing. That's by the way, it's my daughter. Um, <laughs> uh, anybody else? Frustration. <clears throat> Frustration. Okay, so so this video really to me encapsulates why I, I am a big fan of zoos, but this is why I do not work in zoos because it's not actually what you necessarily think. Uh, it ends up that this is a baby chimpanzee in Shanghai. <clears throat> Uh, and the baby chimpanzee is in a group with two other chimpanzee babies. Uh, they participate in zoo acts. And we know that they, are, they were imported through Guinea, and that a year ago she was with her mother in Congo. Uh, and that this is uh, become an epidemic. Um, and the, the United Nations has written reports, and we've all heard about ivory, we've all heard about rhinos, and great apes have become part of this massive illegal trade in animals. So the reason that I don't work in zoos is because I feel like if I'm going to really respond and care about the animals that I work with, it's not that I have anything against zoos, it's that I need to go to where the problems are for my animals. Uh, that, I, that I study and, and that I care about. And obviously we all know uh, about uh, deforestation uh, and you know, we all have a sense that there's the bushmeat trade, but really, honestly, for me, the biggest threat now is the pet trade. If you'd asked me four years ago, I would have told you these two were bigger, but now I'd say the pet trade. In China and um, in other developing economies, but let's just focus on China because I'm most familiar with the situation there, you have a middle class that's the size of the population of the entire United States. The number one TV show on TV right now is called, um, uh, what is it, uh, My Friend, and it's all about uh, a baby pet chimpanzee. Uh, and so we have you know, done research in our own research group showing that when people see TV shows like this, they think that obviously these animals are great pets and that they're not endangered. Uh, and so we also know that people are able uh, in China to get uh, um, chimpanzees uh, for $50,000. And if you were to tell anybody in Congo that the, each of those animals there was worth $50,000, they are, and rightfully so, going to immediately become entrepreneurs. Um, so my big fear was always that there was, there was the potential for the misperception by Central African nations that there was a market but now there actually is a market. It's not a misperception. It really is that there's a market. And the worst thing they can do to any animal, as Paul was talking about, is commercialize it. Um, and uh, it's not just parrots now, it's also great apes. Um, and parrots are suffering from the same uh, problem as well. So, the place that I have chosen to work is a place that really nobody had worked before, before I started working there. Uh, and when I first, uh, and the idea was not mine actually, uh, I was doing my PhD with Richard Rangham, who is just about the most wonderful human being on this planet. Uh, if you ever have a chance to hear him speak, definitely go, and his book, Catching Fire, is wonderful. Uh, anything you can do to interact with him is uh, just a marvelous experience. But Richard said to me as I was finishing my PhD and I was expressing frustration about the context, and I had had people tell me all the time, I had one of my other committee members on my PhD say, well look, you're in a, you're always talking about conservation and welfare. You gotta pick, man. You know, like, you're gonna do this cognition stuff or you're gonna do conservation and welfare. And that conversation, and I'm sure many of you have had this, where it's like, what do you mean I have to choose? I, I, I think these things are both really important and interesting. And I didn't know what to do. And I was like, ah, I guess I have to choose. Or no, I don't wanna choose. And so Richard gave me a solution. He said, well look, why don't you just go to Ngamba Island, the sanctuary, it's gonna be great for research. You know, uh, whatever research dollars you have will go to help their mission to protect and enforce the laws against pet, the pet trade in Uganda. Uh, and you're going to get some killer data. So the first thing, Yo-Yo lives on Ngamba Island, the, the peanut tube experiment. The cooperation experiments all done in Ngamba Island. And if we had done them in Ngamba Island, we actually never could have done those experiments because in zoos and laboratories, they just didn't have the right setup to do the work. So actually we were able to do better research by going to sanctuaries. So PASA sanctuaries, uh, if you go to PASA primates, 
Um, there's a website where you can see, I can't keep up with how many there are now, but there's over 20. Um, and they really uh, are there to provide lifetime care for animals that are, uh, are um, targets that are, are, have been targets of the bushmeat trade and the pet trade. Um, uh, when orphans come in, they usually receive or have a, a surrogate mother, who is a human, uh, typically, and they have access to um, primary tropical forest, typically, and, and uh, most of the sanctuaries, certainly the more well-established ones. Um, so you can imagine coming from Yerkes in a laboratory context, or even a zoo, which I, I love zoos, and zoos are really great. I've done lots of research in zoos, but imagine, that's my subject. So after I finish doing my experiment, that's where my subject goes. Now that's the place I want to work. So uh, and they were they they all live in multi-female, multi-male <coughs> groups. Um, and the what happened was then I went to Gamba, but I also had had a lifetime fascination with bonobos, and I desperately wanted to work with bonobos. And I'll spare you all the scientific reasons why. Um, but in in um, trying to find a place to work with bonobos, well, there really isn't a place where you can work with bonobos where you have a sample size that would be big enough, and also the facility is designed where you could do some really creative, innovative work. Well, there's one bonobo sanctuary in the entire world, and it was founded by Claudine Andre, pictured here. Um, and so this is one of the other things that when you start working with sanctuaries, is you, you get to not only do great science, but you also are inspired because you could not meet a more inspirational character, um, somebody who's done more for animals, and now has done more for science, because she welcomed us to her sanctuary. Uh, even though all my colleagues kept saying, oh no, these are crazy people, you don't want to work there, they're never going to let you do science, you'll never be able to do good science there, because they're so wrapped up in welfare and you know, conservation. So just to let you know, if you go to our website, and I'll give you the website link, we have a research tab on our, on our page, We've had 60 publications, six zero publications since 2006. So in, uh, what is that, less than 10 years, we've had 60 publications. So this is somebody who's really not a scientist, um, actually is very skeptical of science, but has welcomed us and understands the value. And it's beautiful because it, unlike in a laboratory where honestly welfare is something that is um, required, but it's not a priority. And here, anything I do, anything that I'm going to do as a research project, this person risked her life for that animal. And I have to get her to say yes. Can you repeat her name, please? Uh, Claudine Andre. So anything that I do scientifically, I've got to get this person to say yes. Um, and so I much prefer that. It is frustrating. It doesn't always work out. And sometimes there are misunderstandings. We're all human. But I much prefer the conflict and the confusion and the problems at a sanctuary than I do the equal level of frustration, if not more, at a laboratory where I'm actually fighting the opposite battle. Where, you know, can I put in something nice for the animal? You know, and they're saying no. Whereas here, it's like, no, I think if you do the test for, you know, you're saying you want to do your games for four hours, I don't know what you're doing for two. So it's the opposite. I'm always fighting for, can I do some more science, more science? I much prefer that because it's all about this guy. It's not about me. Uh, I, don't, I don't have a priority because I don't own those animals like the laboratory owns the animals. Okay, so this is um, one of our, one of everybody, if you work at Lolly Albano, this is one of our favorite stories. It's Lomella. Lomella came in totally dehydrated and in horrible shape. Uh, she quickly made friends with other orphans. This is Wanda and Lomella, uh, and obviously um, uh, she had got lots of TLC, tender loving care from uh, her human surrogate mother as well. Um, and this is Lomella, uh, I believe it was about 10 months later, uh, after she was at the sanctuary. And even better, this is Lomella now. Uh, Lomella actually doesn't live, the sanctuary is in Kinshasa, in the capital. Uh, it's actually outside the um, natural habitat of bonobos, but Lo uh, Lomelo was actually released. Uh, we have a release site up in the Congo Basin, and she was released back into the wild. And uh, I think six months ago, she had a baby. Um, so uh, that's what the sanctuary is all about, is taking these animals that have no hope and giving them a life again. 
uh, given how critically valuable they are. But at the same time, while she was in sanctuary, she was in a lot of my studies. Uh, and she actually participated and, and, don and, and donated her time and energy to um, uh, contributing knowledge about her species. So if you're interested in Loli Abonobo, this is our website. And actually, Suzanne Herschel is here. Uh, and Suzanne, you have to stand up and wave so people know who you are. I know it's embarrassing. But, <laughs> all right, there's Suzanne. So if you're interested in the sanctuary, uh, so Suzanne has uh, gotten uh, involved in uh, creating a Swiss Nonprofit that's really the closest thing we have here to here to help uh, the sanctuary and everything we're doing with uh, the bonobo. So go find Suzanne and she can come up with creative ways if you're interested in, in uh, learning more or being involved. Or go check out our website. Okay. Um, so in terms of research, uh, my, my radical idea and, and what I've said many times publicly now uh, in the United States, much to the consternation of many people who do research still in laboratories, and I've been sort of the front of uh, the front man for anybody who wants to say, if we lose the lab, we can't do science anymore. Um, uh, and, and my radical statement is that we can do everything that you can do with great apes in a laboratory. We can do all of it. We can do all of it in a sanctuary and we can do much more, and we can do it much cheaper. Uh, so I can do much better research for cheaper in sanctuaries, and that's the egocentric uh, argument. But not only that, but it's a win-win because I'm actually helping the animals that I work with. So this idea that it's always animal versus human has got to go. We've got to start thinking about how can we help humans by also helping animals. Um, and I think that there are ways to do it, but I think that people are so, um, there's infrastructure that needs to be protected. There, there are jobs, you know, there's a system that's been built, institutions, and so obviously you're going to have very strong inertia to um, not embrace this. Okay, so here's just some of the cool studies. Just quick, I'll give you a couple of highlights of things we've discovered. Uh, we were able to do the first comparative developmental research between chimps and bonobos, there literally had never been a quantitative comparison of our two closest relatives to each other before we started doing research. There had been um, qualitative comparisons, but never quantitative comparisons of their cognitive So we found that bonobos are developmentally delayed. Um, they don't uh, develop the same level of spatial memory as chimpanzees. That's just one example. I can tell you why that's interesting, but. Um, I'll spare you. Another really fun one is this is something you could never have done in a zoo or a laboratory. Uh, we were able to compare chimpanzees and bonobos for their cortisol and testosterone reactivity in a socially stressful situation. So we had male bonobos and male chimpanzees that we showed, okay, there's going to be food. You're going to be able to share this food or not share this food. Uh, and in, in anticipation of going in and potentially sharing food or not being able to share food, we took saliva samples before and after this, and what we found was that chimpanzees have no, chimpanzee males don't have a change in their cortisol, and they have a big change in their testosterone, okay? In anticipation of potentially competing for food. Bonobos have the exact opposite response. So male bonobos get really stressed out, they have a big cortisol spike, a massive cortisol spike actually, no change in testosterone. So this is consistent with the idea uh, that chimpanzees are sort of status driving, whereas bonobos have a more passive coping style. And so this type of comparison <coughs> is absolutely impossible in US laboratories. You want to know why? There are no bonobos in US laboratories. <laughs> in the age of comparative genomics, where we're comparing genomes left and right, how are we going to learn interesting things by comparing the genome of chimpanzees to themselves? When we have all these other interesting species and other great apes we can look at. Okay, so I want to show you one fun video that sort of summarizes uh, uh, some of the most exciting work we've done with bonobos, um, and then it'll uh, lead into some of the other sort of educational welfare activities we've done regarding apes. I don't know if the sound can work though. Oh, it doesn't work. You guys hear that? Yes. Not one. And bonobos and chimpanzees are like our cousins. A little bit like having two first cousins. They're equally related to you, but they're different from each other. One of the reasons people haven't heard of bonobos is because bonobos only live south of the Congo River in one country, the Democratic Republic of Congo. There's 
tells us part of human altruism, maybe is a result of biology. Whether it goes to the degree of humans is then another question, but at least it's in part of our DNA. In the beginning, there are two bonobos here. So once we knew that, we got really interested. What is it about bonobos emotionally that allows them to do this? So one of the fun things that's been used to understand how animals, including humans, feel about others is to look at contagious yawning. We know that contagious yawning in humans develops in young infants right as they begin to have empathy towards others. Start recording. This is my body. Um, so we showed what we call bonobo TV. They saw either a bonobo that they knew very well yawning, or they saw a bonobo they'd never seen before yawning. When they saw the videos of the strangers yawning, they yawned more often than when they saw the video of the bonobos they know yawning. So it seems that bonobos have even a level of emotional engagement or even empathy towards strangers that we don't see in other species. Here is a species that could teach us more about how to be humane than probably anything else in the world but they are in a place in the world that they are under a lot of pressure. Most of the bonobos that we study, the mothers have been killed by poachers and hunters. And when they were little kids, they were sold in the black market as pets. Lonelier Bonobo Sanctuary is an orphanage for bushmeat victims. Today, I would say that things are harder than ever. China and India are having a huge influence in Central Africa. You know, our big fear was that there was going to be a perceived market for bushmeat, a perceived international um, market for pet great apes. But the reality today is there's a real market. Great apes are being sold for fifty to three hundred thousand dollars each to zoos, circuses, and private individuals. In terms of how many bonobos are remaining in the wild, the short answer is a scary few. For each ape that leaves the country and actually is in a zoo in China, you're going to have lost at least two or three dozen to get that individual out. You just can't sustain those losses when you're talking about a slow reproducing species like great apes. <coughs> the solution is to not only work hard to save those wild places, to end the bushmeat trade, which is what Friends of Bonobos is all about, but also to engage with the Chinese. That's our goal, to get people excited about bonobos just like we are. So that's what we did. Um, my wife and I, uh, or that's what we were trying to do. My wife and I actually went and taught at Duke's New University, uh, Duke Kunshan. Um, it's near Shanghai. Uh, that's why my daughter was in a video with a chimpanzee from Shanghai, the Shanghai Zoo. Um, and so I got to teach 50 Chinese students, and um, there I am, trying to get them excited. Um, and, uh, and not only did we talk about human psychology and evolution, but we talked about all these issues that we've been talking about now. Um, and this was one of the most successful things that happened. This was one of my students, and he was confronted with that same infant, and I didn't say anything. I actually, we just went, and we went to the zoo, and I talked about the life history of chimpanzees. I didn't try to preach to them. I just took them to the zoo. And then we, we obviously decompressed afterwards. <laughs> Where's their mother? Whose mother? 
which of these must be false? Wait, why are you asking that question? Because we made that mistake. We've now waiting to. They're not weaned yet? Yeah. Because if they're if they're like three or four, right? They'd still be with their mom? Yeah. Huh. So what do you think happened to their mom? He says maybe they're in the next cage. Yeah. So, so, uh, so what we tried to do is we went to China and we got people excited. We actually formed a little Friends of Bonobos China. Um, and I, the, the the man in the video with me is Dr. Kenji Tan. He's now he's completed his PhD at Duke uh, and he's working on his postdoc at Zoo Atlanta uh, with Tara Stowinski, um, who some of you may know, uh, and she's the director of uh, the Diane Fossey Fund. Um, and he is the first Chinese citizen to ever study great apes in Africa. So the normal thing you do if Dan's or the lumber company or you know any European company or American company did something that was naughty, you would go to the press via academics. Uh, and you'd have your conservation organizations try to ring the bell. Well, China is obviously a different place. And if you have no academics and you don't have any freedom of the press, you have a problem. And so that's what we've been trying to figure out is how do we work around the issue that the biggest market and the biggest, the number one um, economic partner for Africa now is China. Um, yet we have no academics and we have no freedom of press uh, to try to um, stop this. So one of the things we're doing um, is not only trying to get young people excited and have students take this on uh, who are Chinese in a Chinese way. It's not, it's not going to work to just go and lecture people. It's got to come from inside. Um, so that means we have to inspire people in China and people care desperately about animals there. When I was there, tons of people have pet dogs and love animals. Um, they literally just are not aware. One of the big problems with the ivory trade with, with um, elephants is most people in China thought that it didn't kill or hurt the elephant. It was like losing a tooth. They thought it was just their tooth fell out and that people were picking these things up off the ground. Um, and so one of the big campaigns against ivory was um, from the famous basketball star, I'm blanking on his name right now, but um, the Chinese basketball star, I played for Houston, what's his name? Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Whatever. Anyway, he did a huge campaign, and he's like, he's, when you go to China, it's amazing. There are no people on any billboards. There are billboards everywhere. There's no people on any billboard. And you know, in the U.S., there are people on every billboard. No people, nowhere. The only person is this basketball player. He's huge. <laughs> Like, you know, there, there, there's no other person. So, so he had a big impact on trying to educate people about the ivory trade. Um, but this is my students, and actually what we did was something like what we're going to do in the workshop this afternoon, is they were all upset. They said, gosh, we didn't know about any of this. What can we do? I said, I don't know. What can you do? And so we had a workshop like we're going to have this afternoon. And they said, I'll tell you what we're going to do. When we go on the zoo trip, we're going to do a survey, and we're going to find out about people's attitudes, and we're going to see if how we talk about great apes affects people's attitudes towards them. So if we have a paragraph before we actually survey them and say, did you know that great apes, and we're gonna use some kind of wording that tries to elicit empathy, we're gonna use wording that makes people feel guilty, we're gonna use wording that um, makes people realize the egocentric value of great apes, and then we're just gonna give people facts. And we're gonna vary those four things, and we're gonna see which is the right way to speak to Chinese people about great apes to affect their attitudes and have them care more based on their response. Of course, that's just one step in a long journey, but it was really cool. It was from the students themselves, and they went and did the study, and we're working on publishing it, and we actually ended up doing the same study in Congo as well. Uh, the other thing we did is my postdoc, Kenji Tan, led an international coalition of 27 organizations against the TV show I told you about, and he was able to become very good friends with the CEO of the largest science media outlet in China. It's called Gawker, um, it's spelled G-U-A-K-R, which is interesting because there's a, there's a media outlet in the United States called Gawker, which is G-A-W-K-E-R. <laughs> and I, I never, I, I met the CEO of the Chinese company and I never said, you naughty, naughty person for copying that name. But, but uh, anyway, um, they were able to get millions, tens of millions of people to respond to this TV show who didn't know about it because we had them through the science media put this and push this story, and because the main person that was interviewed was a scientist who was Chinese. 
who would talk about it. And so then we got the United Nations, this is the Great Survival Partnership, to post and really protest that this show was happening. Um, so did the show, was the show canceled? No, it's the, it's, they're making tons and tons of money off the show. Um, but they did lose some of their sponsors. And uh, we learned a lot about who's making the show. And it ends up, it's just one zoo in China, in Guangzhou, that is the real issue. Uh, thankfully, right now, it's not, it hasn't spread beyond one city. Um, but we know what, where the problem is, we know who the, the people are, um, and so that's progress. The other thing we're doing at the sanctuary, just to highlight uh, the human um, benefit from this research, is uh, obviously the bushmeat trade, um, not only does it end up with dead apes, and it ends up with pupet trade, but it also ends up with dead people. So uh, Ebola is a great example. This is a, a, a case of monkeypox that was spread from eating monkeys uh, from wild animals. Um, and there's studies that this stuff gets back to not only Europe, but also the United States as well. This was a study done a couple of years ago where meat that was, bush meat that was being transported in airplanes, uh, it had all sorts of scary stuff in it. Um, so it's very easy for meat that people are taking back to Europe and the United States that are relative to um, be uh, infected with naughty stuff. So I have some colleagues uh, at Duke and UCLA, uh, and we're doing a One Health program. Uh, and the question is, um, oops, can we can we somehow affect the bushmeat market? Can we study the bushmeat markets? Can we monitor and and do surveillance of what is in the meat? Um, can we go to the, somehow in the Congolese airports and help them do better jobs screening? Uh, and also, there's a big issue, and this is how to get the Chinese interested, is the number one thing that uh, the Chinese are doing is exporting labor into Central Africa, who then come back two years later after eating bush meat for years. So they've got lots of people who are eating this stuff that are coming back to China, and that potentially scares uh, people into thinking about, well, huh, maybe we should be part of the solution instead of part of the problem if all our people are going to come back with these terrible diseases. Okay. So we are involved in what's called a One Health program. We're doing veterinary research with the bonobos. We're trying to study respiratory disease in the bonobos, which is the major factor that kills the bonobos. Uh, we think it's probably anthropogenic in its origin. Probably the caretakers have respiratory infections. They're giving it to the bonobos. But we're also really interested in the larger problem of trying to stop the bushmeat trade by studying its impact and potential for spreading emerging infectious diseases. Okay, so this is just a breakdown I did from uh, a few years ago. This was when I really made people mad. I actually went and presented this at the National Academy of Sciences when they were deciding whether to continue doing laboratory research with chimpanzees. Um, and uh, nobody, none of my colleagues were happy with me. Um, so basically I just took, um, a, I just did a comparison of laboratory publications to the publications in uh, Leipzig, in the Leipzig Zoo, Lincoln Park Zoo, the Zoo Atlanta, and then Pasta Sanctuaries during this time period and just looked at the total number of publications related to um, behavior, psychology, cognition, um, anything related to that. And what you see is we publish more. We publish in all the best journals, about the same. Uh, and you know it's very, very comparable, if not better, uh, in the sanctuaries and the zoos. Because the main thing that people are trying to argue is there's no alternative. There's no other place we can do this. Well, too late, guys, because actually we're doing more than you. The other thing I did is I presented this, which really got people mad, um, was this is how much it costs per day um, for, to house an animal, and this is how much um, at the time it was uh, costing to house an animal. And I don't even actually, as a researcher, I don't pay for that, because it's a welfare organization that takes care of its animals. I only contribute to the paying for that. And so when I calculated out what my per diem is, so this is what a researcher has to pay. They have to actually pay the $40 a day to work with an animal at a US laboratory. I actually was paying a quarter uh, per day per subject that I had access to. So I was 1 160th the lab rate. Um, but I did, but we had done you know, as much research. So it can be done. There is an alternative. It is very viable. It is a different culture. It has different problems. We need more resources, just like everybody. But is there an alternative? Absolutely. And is it, is it going to win the day? I think it is. Um, uh, and, and really, the reason is because I have, I've had more students than anybody. Um, because, because we've been able to do research, and these people are going on to start their own uh, labs. So 
um, just to tell you what's happened is there's really a two by two in research, available funding and research costs. And usually when you're working with animals, uh, it's expensive, uh, and especially if you're doing invasive work, it's really expensive work, but there are lots of grants because people are trying to understand deep mechanistic things. And I'm not saying that's good or bad, I'm just trying to tell you the financial models here. So usually it's expensive work, but there's lots of money for it. Uh, when you come to stuff like Jane Goodall's work, well, it's really cheap to do that work, but there are very few grants. So as a young scientist, this is really was my choice. Which, where, where do you want to be? You want to be in this, where you have to get lots of money, but there is lots of money, or do you want to be where there's no money, and it doesn't cost much money. Those were really the choices that you're given. So what I said is, screw that, I'm gonna make up a new thing. And then, of course, you know, if I'm gonna do um, laboratory work with chimpanzees, the reason it went out of business is it's expensive and there, were no money, there was no money. And this is what everybody was saying, get out, get out, you gotta do one of those two things. And I said, screw that, I'm gonna invent this. It's, it's inexpensive and there are lots of grants. Because then I'll kick the butt out of everybody. <laughs> and that's what the sanctuaries represent, but it's also what the dog research represents. And the dog research, we're farther along on the financial part than we are with the great ape work, because, because there's so much inertia of the um, laboratory research, there's resistance to potentially changing to this new model. Whereas in the dog world, it's all new. Uh, and there isn't a, a, the same level of resistance, and we've taken a slightly different path. So, um, uh, we also do dog research, but I want to take a break because I don't know where I am on the time, Sabrina. Uh, about to 10 minutes. Okay, 10 minutes, no problem. Um, so, so with what attention you have left, I saved dogs for last because I figured if you were tired, you would wake up now. Um, <laughs> so, so dogs are a super oh, happy story. Apes are, are, you can be inspired, you can be depressed, choose whatever you want to be when it comes to ape work and research and sanctuaries. But dogs, it's easy. This is a very happy story. Um, what we do is we work with um, the Duke County Cognition Center. Uh, I'm very proud to say that I have tons of people who want to come and visit, and I am always absolutely puzzled as to why. Because I have a space that isn't even as big as the room we are in here, and it is lot, a lot like this room except that there's nothing in it. It's just an empty room and it has some cameras. And that is the Duke Cannon Television Center. What that means is that I have no research animals. I do not, as a scientist that do, own a single animal. Um, but I actually have access to more animals than anybody at Duke. Yes. Because when we opened the Duke Cannon Cognition Center, we had over 1,500 people sign up to volunteer to bring their dogs in to my empty room and play cognitive games whenever we call and ask them to do it. So I have 1,500 animals, no vet bills. <laughs> I don't have to deal with the ethics people because I don't have any animals. And my animals are in the habitat they evolved to be in, which is in your bed at night and uh, being fed some expensive dog food and being super, super happy. Um, so um, that's, what, that's, that's how the Duke Canine Foundation Center uh, works where, again, it was designed to beat the system. And the good thing is, if I don't have any money, if I go broke and I don't have a single grant, I don't euthanize my animals, which is what many researchers have to do. I don't have to scramble to find a sanctuary to put them in that then can't put them in it and then burden the sanctuary with the, these animals that I brought in and didn't, couldn't take care of for their lives. If I go broke, nothing happens. My empty room is empty just like it always is. Uh, if I have lots of money, I can do lots more research. It's that simple. So it's really a great model, and I really think it's gonna save comparative psychology and bring comparative psychology back from essentially being dead, especially in the United States, because as neuroscience took off, comparative psychology, all the things that we're interested in, behavior, how animals think, there's not a lot of resources for it. But I think the dog is really gonna save it. Why, why, uh, why do people So the question was, why do people agree to bring their dogs in um, and uh, play games? I have no idea. <laughs> and it was an empirical question whether they would continue to come, because things are new, and it's always fun when it's new, and they come the first time, and the big worry, you know, uh, and there were lots of people who would have thought, oh, this guy's crazy, you know, he's gonna go down the tubes or whatever. 
Because, you know, people are going to come in once, but they're never going to come in again. Uh, totally not what happens. Um, we, we, we have about a 90% success rate if we ask somebody to come, not only do they come, but they come on time, and sometimes it's a problem, they come early. Um, and, and really the only problem we had was when we first were announcing, it was all over the media because all the reporters are desperately looking for dog stories, and if it's about science, it's even better. Uh, they can get higher up on the news page and get more money for writing their article. Uh, and so it was all this free advertisement. We had people from Britain, we had people from Mexico, we had people from Canada, and they were applying to bring their dog to the new Canine Cognition Center. So we literally have to screen the zip code and all sorts of other things before we invite. And you can imagine, you know, we had somebody drive all the way from South Carolina, um, you know, the neighboring state, about six hours, stay in a hotel for three nights before we figured out, wait, you drove six hours with your dogs in a van to come here for an hour? Um, so then we had to you know, be more careful and asking. So uh, dog people love their dogs. Um, and people really enjoy having their dogs play these games uh, and learning more about what's going on in their minds. They also like the idea that they're contributing uh, to science. But the other thing is that people really love about it is they get to say that their dog went to Duke. <laughs> and, and in the United States, there's some cachet for that. Uh, you know, the university you went to is, you know, kind of like whatever. And so they get to say, my dog went to Duke, and you know, my joke is we have the highest acceptance rate and the cheapest tuition at Duke. Um, and so people like it. They get to take their dog to Duke. So I started studying dogs because of this guy, uh, my, my pet dog growing up. Since I only have probably five minutes left, I'm going to just rush through and tell you, it ends up that... Um, uh, we found out that dogs do interesting things, and we'll, we can talk about this in, oh, sorry. Yeah, you can, I mean, after lunch, you can take more time to finish your talk on, the, on dogs if you want to ask. All right, all right, all right. So do you want to break here? Do you want me to stop? Yeah, let's do sure. that. So let's have lunch. There's a few of you said yesterday, actually, because there's not so much to do. Um,